Hello, David Diga Hernandez here, and welcome to Spirit Church. Today, I'm going to be talking about the call of God. Now, I want you to know that God has placed a call on your life, and today we're going to look to Isaiah chapter 6, and we're going to study when God called Isaiah the prophet, and then we're going to draw some truth from it that I believe will help you pursue the call of God on your life, as well as see the call of God in your life, because there are many who are watching, I believe, who in their hearts, in their minds, they're battling and struggling to believe that God has called them. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna pray that that is done away with today and we're gonna believe God for breakthrough in your life and we're gonna believe that God is gonna begin to use your life greatly from this day forward. So stay tuned for that. But right now, Stephen Moctezuma is here with us. He's gonna lead you first in some worship. As you were singing that song today, I pray that everything within you truly was surrendering to the will of God. We're going to look in Isaiah chapter 6, and we're going to look at the call of Isaiah. And I believe that as we read this story today, that God is going to begin to speak to you. Because let me just say this right off the bat, and I want to do away with anything that's in your mind that the enemy may be assaulting you with. He may be lying to you, maybe telling you that you don't have a call on your life. Let me tell you something. If you are watching this video, if you can hear what I'm saying now, God has called you to do something for Him. Something very special that only you can do for the Lord. There is nobody else on this earth that can fulfill the destiny that God has placed on your life. You're the only one who can do what God has called you to do. You may look at your life and say, Lord, I don't have much. I don't have talent. I can't speak. I can't sing. I can't um, think of anything in particular, nothing specific comes to mind. I can't imagine what I might be able to do for your glory. I want you to know that God has given you something. God has placed something in your hand. And if nothing else, if you say, I don't have any talent, but, but you say, God, I don't have any ability, 
You may not have talent, but you have time. You may not have talent, that in your mind anyway, but you have influence. God has given you something. And I like to say that your purpose is linked with your passion. In other words, if there is a passion that so burns in your heart, then I think it was a part of the plan that God has put for your life. When there is a passion to do something, when there is a passion to sing, when there is a passion to, let's just take, for example, the people working here. There are people here who have passion about working behind a camera. You just heard Stephen Mock the Zuma sing. You may have a passion to do worship. You see me teaching the Word. You may have a passion to teach God's Word. Whatever it may be, it's not just limited to those things. God has placed something in you. God has put a talent in you. God has put a gift in you that you are to use for His glory. So let's just start off on the right foot and let's just get to the truth of the matter that God has placed something within you. The enemy will fight you very hard on this. The enemy will work so hard to discourage you, to tell you that there's nothing in you that you can do for God. But I want to tell you, I'm here to tell you the truth. And the scripture says that God has given to each one a gift. Just go study 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and 1 Corinthians chapter 14. You're going to see that as a member of the body of Christ, you serve a very specific a very important and a very real purpose. You are not placed on this earth without a purpose. If there is breath within you, if there is a life within you, then there is purpose within you. So let's do away with the lies of the enemy. Now, this isn't really a message about believing that there's a call of God in your life, but um, I don't believe in coincidence. There's no, there, it's not by accident that you're watching this video today because God has placed a call on your life. And let's look now to the scripture, Isaiah chapter 6. As we look at the scripture in Isaiah chapter 6, you may find some things that as you begin to obey what the word of God says, as you begin to follow the example of Isaiah, you may start to see the call of God appearing more clearly before your eyes than ever before. It's quite possible that after you hear this lesson, that the call of God will become clear right in front of your eyes. And you'll see, sharp as can be an image, of what God has called you to do. I believe it. Let's get into the word now. Isaiah chapter 6. This is what the scripture says. It was in the year King Uzziah died that I saw the Lord. He was sitting on a lofty throne, or the scripture in King James puts it, high and lifted up. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Attending him were mighty seraphim, each having six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two, they covered their feet, and with two, they flew. They were calling out to each other, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of heaven's armies. The whole earth is filled with his glory. Verse 4 says, Their voices shook the temple to its foundations, and the entire building was filled with smoke. Then I said, It's all over, I am doomed, for I am a sinful man. I have filthy lips. And I live among a people with filthy lips. Yet I have seen the King, the Lord of heaven's armies. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with the burning coal he had taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. He touched my lips and it said, See, this coal has touched your lips. Now your guilt is removed and your sins are forgiven. Verse 8. Then I heard the Lord asking, Whom should I send as a messenger to this people? Who will go for us? There's a reference to the Trinity right there. And I said, Here I am. Send me. Now this is, there's so much in this entire chapter. And we're just going to get into the very specifics of what was just in the few verses that we read. First of all, the scripture says that Isaiah saw the Lord in the year that King Uzziah had died. Now, not only did he see the, the, the Lord in the year that King Uzziah had died, but Isaiah saw the Lord when he was working in the temple. So number one, Isaiah saw the Lord when he was working. Number one, you have to be active. You have to get to work. You have to start doing something. Many people are so afraid of doing something that's outside of the will of God, that they end up doing nothing at all. And I believe it's a sort of 
charismatic superstition that we've begun to take on within ourselves where we say, well, I don't want to move outside the boundaries of what God has for me. I want to be in the perfect will of God, right? You've heard that before. I want to be in the perfect will of God. I don't want to do anything that's, that's not God. That may be a good thing, but it's not a God thing. And the problem is that because we look for very specific instruction, because we wait to, to hear the voice from heaven or the clouds to open up, we wait for God to speak in a very specific manner, because of that, we neglect the things that He has told us to do in His Word. Now, the Bible tells us some very specific things. People say, what's the will of God for my life? Well, the Bible is very clear on what the will of God for your life is. Are you ready to know? The Bible tells us what the will of God is for every single person. In lifestyle, you're called to live holy. In purpose, You're called to worship. Every single one of us were created to love and worship God. That's our purpose. In ministry, you're called to spread the gospel. You say, well, I'm not a preacher. Well, it doesn't matter. You're called to spread the gospel with whatever gifts you have. Now, this is where people get hung up. Because we know that in lifestyle, we're called to holiness. We know that in purpose, we're called to worship. We're called to love God. But we... We look to our specific task. We say, Lord, but what do you want me to do specifically here on the earth? Well, whatever it takes to spread the gospel with what you have, that's what God's called you to do. Many of us, we wait around and we're hoping that God will get very specific with us. But the will of God is progressively revealed as you obey, as you begin to move out. You know, Paul, I believe it was Paul the Apostle who wanted to go to Asia, I believe it was. And he says that he wanted to go to certain regions in Asia. And as he was journeying there, the Holy Spirit stopped him. You can count on the Holy Spirit stopping you in your tracks when you're on the move. But if you never move, you give the Lord nothing to correct. How can he correct your steps if you're not taking any? How can he give you instructions for the next step if you haven't taken the first step? Isaiah was at work. He was working in the temple. He was serving. He was dedicating his life. He was doing what he knew to do, and then God revealed what he was to do next. Do what's before you, and then instruction will, become, will come from the Lord. As you begin to do what you know to do, God will reveal what you don't know you should do. So some people, they want to, I mean, I don't know how many times it's happened to me. People will call me, and because, especially because I have a television ministry, people call me all the time, evangelists, pastors, teachers, great people. But they'll call me, and they'll come to lunch, and it's usually the same. And I usually know what they want, because they'll they'll call, and they'll say, hey, I want to meet with you. And they'll say, well, what is it about? They go, well, there's some stuff I want to share with you. I have to do it over lunch. Everyone has to do it over lunch, right? So I said, okay, sometimes if I feel right about it in my spirit, I'll go and meet with um, someone I've never met um, and go and have lunch with them. And they'll go on about the message that God's laid on their heart. And I I always love to hear what God's doing with them. But then they get very direct and they'll say, well, I want to share this on your program. And sometimes, as you've known, I've brought guests on the program. They'll sit in a chair across from me and I'll ask them questions. And that's a God thing. It has to be built through relationship. I usually don't have people I don't know on the program. But as they're sitting in front of me, they'll either want to come on the program or they'll want connections, right? And and me personally, this is just me personally, I don't like to look at ministry like it's political. I don't like uh, political maneuvering or, you know, ladder climbing or networking for the sake of self-promotion. I don't like that. I can't do that. I've, I've never, it's, it's always just been very, I've always despised that sort of um, path of ministry because I don't believe it's the way the kingdom is to function. Uh, we're to serve one another. But every so often you get someone in front of you who's very ambitious. And so they'll be sitting in front of me and they'll start asking for contacts. They want everything that you have. They want it laid out for them in a matter of weeks. I've had people sit in front of me uh, not realizing that it's taken almost 10 years to get to the point where we are now. And they'll say, how do we do what you're doing? Tell me what to do. You know, they'll pull out a notepad. Who do I talk to about getting on TV? Where do I get cameras? You know, and I'm thinking in the back of my mind, this took years to do. I don't think it could be done in a couple of weeks. And what I love to tell somebody like that is I'll say, hey, listen, I have a connection for you. This person is very, very wealthy. And they get really excited. They start to lean in and they go, really? You know, they they want, you know, connections, so donors for their ministry. So this person is very wealthy and very generous. 
And they, that then I have their attention. They go, oh, wow, okay, tell me more about this person. I said, not only that, this person has advised presidents and national leaders. This person is friends with, um, what are they called, type A celebrities. Um, this person knows the influencers of the influencers. And then they get really excited. They go, wow, really? I said, yes. Not only that, this person is one of the most popular person, personalities in the world. And I know him. And I go, really? I go, and I can connect you with him. And he can help you on your ministry. He's going to be able to do everything you need him to do. And as they're leaning in, they go, okay, well, who is it? I say, he's Jesus. And he's all you need to get to the next level. And at that point, you know, usually they're somewhat disappointed, which I wonder why they are. Um, and the truth of the matter comes into play. People don't want to take the next steps. They want to get right into doing the things that they say, see as the important things. But can I tell you something? The little acts of obedience that you take today, right now, are just as important as what people perceive to be the important things. Your daily personal obedience to the Lord is just as important as those things that men deem as esteemed or, you know, worthy of praise and on and on. You know, but God doesn't think that way anyway. But those things that come before you every day that we neglect to do, that is what the Lord looks at when it comes to promoting you to your call. So you may be looking around and waiting for that opportunity to come for you to sing in front of thousands or for you to preach in front of thousands or for you to do something. When the opportunity rests within your local church, what about ushering at your church? What about, what about volunteering in the children's ministry at your church? Do you pay your tithes and offerings to your local church? Do you give and support? Then how can we expect others to support us if we're not supporting the call of God on others? The scripture says, he who refreshes shall himself be refreshed. Do you serve in the areas of the little things? Do you serve what men consider to be the least of these? If you don't, you're not ready to step into the next phase of ministry. Isaiah was willing to do the little things. The glory of God showed up on Isaiah's life when he was tending in the temple. I remember one of the first experiences I had with the glory of God. I've not shared this story very often, but many of you know I started in ministry, my first ministry, and I'm very proud to say, very happy to say, that it was flipping songs. I was the guy who, you know, the words that come up on the screen during worship, I was the guy who pushed the button that brought the next songs up. I did the, that for almost two or three years. But I remember as I was worshiping in the sound room and I was pushing the button on the computer screen and watching the words, making sure everything lined up with the worship, I was singing my heart out to God. I was worshiping. I said, Lord, every time I press this button, let it be an act of worship to you. And I valued that ministry so much. And I remember... As I was doing it, the Lord told me, look. I just heard in my spirit, look. And as I'm turning my head, I saw what looked to be a white flame of fire. And in that white flame of fire, I saw the face of a lion. This is while I'm flipping songs. I saw the face of a lion in that flame. Now, I'm not one to say I've seen things. That doesn't happen to me very often, but it was a very special moment in my life. And I, as I looked, the flame rushed toward me and it entered inside of me. And the Lord told me, I've put my fire inside of you. And since that moment, things began to change in my life. I began to tap into different realms of glory. But the Lord visited me. He touched my life as I was serving in the little things. I started to do something. Stop waiting around. The, the big opportunity is never going to come if you don't serve in the little. I've heard people say things like, well, I want God to do something fast with me. I want God to do something special with me. And we have this, some people have this sense of entitlement as if, well, I'm special and I, I, I'm going to have a call. My call is going to come without hardly any work, without hardly any serving. It's just going to happen for me and others are going to do all the work for me. No, that is not how God works. In fact, his most anointed servants had to wait the longest. Moses was in the desert for 40 years. 
King David was tending sheep for who knows how long. Isaiah was serving in the little. He did not wait. He served in the little. Number two, it says it was in the year that King Uzziah had died. Prophets would serve the king. Prophets would inform the king. They were like advisors. In fact, it was amazing how some of the prophets were able to see in the chambers of the king's enemies. So he could tell by prophetic word, the king, what advancements in warfare the enemy was going to take. Can you imagine having a prophet that gifted as an advisor for your army? And he's telling them this is where the enemy is going to move. I and mean, that's how prophets worked with kings. But the problem was that prophets focused their service on the kings. That was somewhat of a problem. God didn't show Isaiah his glory. God didn't call Isaiah to the next phase of his ministry until all of the kings had died. There's only one throne on your heart and only one can sit on it. Jesus said you can't serve two masters. You have to hate one and love the other or vice versa. Let me ask you something. Is it really Jesus who's on the throne of your heart? Is it really the master who's number one, your first love, your priority in all things? Or is it a spouse? Is it a child, maybe one of your sons or daughters? Is it family? Is it business? Is it work? Is it ministry itself? Is it your own ambition? I mean, these are things that often many people wrestle with, but in an even more sad case, something more trivial could take the place of your heart. Is it possible that entertainment has taken the place on the throne? Is it possible that the cares of this world have distracted you from the call of God that lay before you? Does Jesus sit on the throne of your heart? Have all other kings died? Maybe your emotions sit on the throne of your heart. Your anger tells you how you live your life. Your depression tells you how you live your life. Your fear tells you how you live your life. Maybe if it's not exciting, if it's not thrilling, if it's not entertaining, you don't bother. You know, not everything about ministry is glamorous, though sometimes it may appear that way from the outside looking in. What about hours of studying that go into a lesson like this? What about the trials you have to go through for the Lord to shape you? You know, the promises of God, they are yes and amen. But if God is going to mature a believer to stand at the place where they can be anointed by God, they have to go through some things. If you don't want to grow, if you want to stay in low levels of power, don't face any trials. But if you want to mature, if you want to grow, if you want to really go into the deeper things of Christ, then you have to face some things. God's not going to give you a platform. God's not going to give you a voice. Look around you. What kind of influence do you have? It's equivalent to how much you've gone through and how much the Lord has processed you. And I want to encourage you that anybody, anybody at all, can give their heart to the Lord in fullness and come to the places of greater ministry. But it takes determination. You have to decide. You have to make up your mind once and for all that you're going to follow Jesus. Maybe you serve Him and you're saved. That's wonderful. Christians make it to heaven, but disciples make a difference. Your faith in God, your faith in what Jesus has done, will save your soul. But your obedience to the call of God on your life will save the souls of others. I'm not concerned with just going to heaven. I want to see how many I can possibly bring with me. God has called you to do something for the kingdom. But He's not going to reveal Himself. You're not going to see His glory. You're not going to climb to greater levels of power. You're not in the power of the Holy Spirit I'm talking about. You're not going to go to greater levels of influence if you cannot be obedient with where you are and if you cannot surrender your all to Jesus. You have to make up in your mind now that He comes before anyone in anything, no matter what. An odd story I have 
And what's funny is some people might think it cruel, but it really helped to shape the way I view ministry. You know, my grandmother is a very spirit-filled woman of God. Her and my grandfather were missionaries to Russia. My grandfather almost died serving the Lord there in Russia. They faced so much hardship. And they would bear the, the winters. And they went later on in their years. They didn't, they didn't wait until, I mean, they didn't do it early on. They waited until they were older and they responded to the call of God. And my grandmother one day was, I forgot, I think I was sitting on the kitchen counter and she was feeding me something, talking to me. I must have been like five or six and I remember this vividly. And she told me, she said, you know, you have to love Jesus with all your heart. And that's what she told me. And I said, I remember I just asked her something to the effect of, do you love me more than you love Jesus? And my grandmother could have, you know, you know, nowadays people are so sensitive. They, you know, want to build the child's self-esteem and people are a little paranoid when it comes to kids. But my grandmother, filled with the Spirit and the Word, she told me, she said, no, I love Jesus more than I love you. And I was surprised. I said, really? Because I knew how much my grandmother loved me. And it didn't make me feel bad. It didn't make me feel rejected. It made me marvel at how much she loved Jesus because I realized she loved me a lot. And I thought, that's so amazing. I thought, do you love him more than you love my grandfather? She said, yes, I love him more. And she says, you need to love Jesus more than you love me. You need to love Jesus more than you love your mom and your dad and your brother and sister. And I'll never forget that. I wasn't scarred. I wasn't, it didn't mess with my psychology. But I remember just marveling. I didn't look at her love for me as any less. I looked at her love for Jesus as much more. You don't have to love your family less than you do now. You don't have to love others less than you do now. You just have to love Jesus more than you love them. He has to be first. And if you're not willing to pay that price, you're not worthy. God will dismiss you from service if you're not willing to follow him with whole heart. That's the truth. That is the biblical truth. And I will not apologize for saying that. God will dismiss you from the call if you're not willing to put him first. You have to pay that price. You have to say, Lord, I'm coming after you, and if need be, I'll forsake all and follow you. That's the truth. Now, Isaiah also, the scripture says in verse 2, it says, Attending him were mighty seraphim, each having six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. They were calling out to each other, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of heaven's armies. The whole earth is filled with His glory. Their voices shook the temple to its foundations and the entire building was filled with smoke. Then I said, It's all over. I am doomed. For I am a sinful man. I have filthy lips and I live among a people with filthy lips. Yet I have seen the King, the Lord of heaven's armies. So number one, Isaiah tended to the little things. Number two, all other kings died in Isaiah's life. The Lord was on the throne of his heart. And number three, Isaiah allowed the Lord to cleanse his guilt. We read later of how the angels took a coal from the altar, touched his lips and said, your guilt is gone, you're clean. But it's interesting to me that the first thing that Isaiah saw, and this is how we are, we're so self-absorbed that here is this spectacular celestial view before his eyes. He's catching a glimpse of the very glory of God. Angels are flying about the throne. They're speaking with such power that the very foundation of the building in which he is serving is shaken. And he looks at himself. All of this wonderful power displayed before his eyes and he sees the train of God's robe. Think about this. As large as those temples were, the temple was very large, but God was so large that the, the largeness of the temple was only able to allow for a glimpse of the, the train of his robe, the end of his robe. And in the middle of seeing all of this, Isaiah looks at himself. Isn't that so much like us? That here God offers the power with his word. He offers his truth. He offers his Holy Spirit. 
The scripture promises that when you go, it's not going to be you speaking. It's going to be the Holy Spirit that speaks through you. It says that when you go and lay hands on the sick, they shall recover. That God has given you power to cast out devils. That God has given you the words to speak. That God has given you the ability to open the eyes of the blind, the ears of the deaf. He's given you instruction. He's given you love. He's given you demonstration. His spirit goes with you. His angels guard you. And he puts his seal of approval on you. And all we can look at ourselves and say, Lord, I can't. I'm not able. Why? Because Isaiah looked at himself. Next, Isaiah had to look to God and stop looking at himself. He says, I love the way the King James puts it. He says, Woe is me, for I am a man of, uncle- of, an- I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. He says, woe is me, I'm undone. And I love that the Lord doesn't even respond. God doesn't even respond to his excuse. Instead, the angel, knowing the nature of God, God didn't tell the angel, go get the coal. The angel just did it because the angel kind of knew, well, this is the nature of God. He gets it, says, here, you're cleansed, your guilt is gone. Stop looking at yourself. Stop looking at your ability. It's not in your ability anyway. Can I just tell you something? Can I, if I'm just being open and honest with you, you come to my service, my miracle services, some of you have been there, and you'll see that people have come from all over the world. Some people will be on 14-hour flights to be in one service for two hours, turn right back around and go home. I am no fool. They do not come all that way to hear me preach. Why? Especially because they can... Just hear it online. I would, me personally, I wouldn't drive more than a half an hour to go hear me preach, personally. You look at the ministry and you see me teach, they're good lessons because they're given by the Holy Spirit, but I'm not a spectacular teacher. You look at me, I, there may be some charisma about me, but that's not my charisma, that's the Holy Spirit's charisma. I'm no fool. People don't come to my services to hear me preach, to meet me, to listen to my teachings. They come because the presence of the Holy Spirit is there. I can't heal a single person. People of God, I couldn't heal a headache if it was up to me. The only thing that is special about me, the only thing that is unique or compelling or magnetic or charismatic is the Holy Spirit. He is all that is charismatic about me. He is all that is powerful about me. Other than that, I'm a broken, undone man, just like Isaiah. But do you know why I can go forward and preach the gospel to you on camera and in front of thousands at miracle services? Do you know why I can do that? It's because I don't look at me. I look at Jesus. It's not in my ability to heal anyone. It's not in my ability to set anyone free. It's Him and Him alone. I couldn't build this ministry if I tried. People say, what's the secret? What's the secret? How do you succeed in TV? How do you... All that. I don't know. All I can tell you, and this is the honest truth, before men and before God, all I can tell you is I've obeyed Jesus. I've looked to Him, and I've I've stopped looking at myself. If I look at myself and how I am, I'll I'll get really discouraged really fast. I'll say, Lord, I shouldn't, I I don't have the ability to minister. I don't have the ability to teach. All of that. It's all Him. He's the one. And God can do the same with you. Isaiah looked at himself. And isn't that funny that in the middle of everything that God is doing, in the middle of everything that God promises, we look at ourselves and go, oh, I'm undone. I can't do it. That's what Isaiah did. But don't be discouraged. That's a common mistake. It's a human reaction. And sometimes we look at our flaws and we think that the more aware we become of our flaws, the further we're moving away from God. But I want to encourage you, the more aware you become of your flaws, the more you start to realize all these things that need fixing, it means you're moving deeper. It means you're drawing closer. My wife and I were married just a few months ago. I can guarantee you she's more aware of my flaws now than she was when we were dating but it's because we're getting closer. It's because we're becoming one. It's because I'm starting to weed those things out and I let the Lord work on me. The same thing with the Lord. As we draw closer to Him, we'll start to see more things. King David prayed. I love the way King David prayed. He said this. He said, Lord, do you see anything in me you don't like? Remove it. 
and he opened himself to the eyes of God and said, Lord, remove it all. Don't look to yourself. So Isaiah, number one, he did the little things and he took care of the small. He served it and he was faithful in the little. Number two, he let, I mean, he didn't let, but I mean, this is what happened. All of the kings had died. Number three, eventually after he was cleansed, he looked to God, not himself. And on that point, still on that point, I find it interesting that the very thing, this, I pray this sets some of you free. Hear what I'm saying. Listen, if you hear anything at all about the call of God, listen to what I'm saying right now. Listen, listen. He says this. He says, I'm a man of unclean lips. And then he becomes a prophet. He says, my mouth is filthy. And then God uses him as a mouthpiece of heaven. The very thing that you thought disqualified you from ministry is the very thing God wants to use. I want you to think about that. Let that settle in. The very thing that you thought disqualified you from ministry is the very thing that God will use. Isaiah said, my mouth disqualifies me. And God says, let me use it. Why? The scripture says, when we are weak, then he is strong. Worse than abound, grace much more abounds. Why? Why? So that no flesh can glory in his presence. Do you know why God uses me to stir people's faith? Because I'm a doubter. I was a Thomas. I'm the type of guy who says, Lord, I have to touch, I have to touch the scars. Because I was so full of fear and so full of doubt, the faith of God can come alive within me and see miraculous signs and wonders. God uses me in the area of faith because I was so weak as a doubter. And now the very thing that I thought would disqualify me, God turned it around, filled it, and He uses it now. And He wants to do the same with you. And then finally, the Scripture says, the Lord says, Who will go for us? Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And Isaiah the prophet responds. I love the way the King James puts it so poetically. Here am I, Lord. Send me. You notice God didn't ask Isaiah directly to go for him. He put out the call, just like Jesus. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. There are people right now ready to hear the gospel, but there are so few who are preaching it. What's funny is that Jesus says, pray therefore to the Lord of harvest. He would send workers. And then the disciples prayed, the Lord sent workers, and then they went. Because when you pray for a problem, God will often send you as the solution. If you pray for a hurting world, God will send you as healing. If you pray for a dying world, God will send you as life. If you pray for a deceived world, God will send you as truth. God will send you as you pray. That's why Jesus told the disciples, pray to the Lord of the harvest that he would send workers because he knew as they prayed, they'd be moved to action. As you pray, you'll be moved to action. But the Lord said, whom shall I send? I almost would have been offended if I was Isaiah because he was the only one in the temple the only human in the temple anyway. The angels, they're already in use. They're worshiping God. And so imagine, here's Isaiah, this dramatic display, this dramatic heavenly display before his eyes. He's the only one standing in the temple alone and trembling. And God kind of looks around and says, who am I going to send? Why? Because God wants you to make the move. Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 13, I believe, says that if you seek him with all your heart, you will find him. James chapter 4, verse 7 says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. He puts the initiation on you. God's already sent his son. God's already given us very clear instruction through the word. He's already given us very clear instruction through the word. 
But he's waiting on you now to respond. It's on you. You have to step out in faith. You have to take that step of faith and move. I want to pray for you. Any one of these points touch your heart concerning the call of God. I believe that it's time to take that step. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Take that step of faith now. Move out and begin to do what God has called you to do. You don't know what it is? Then start serving the little things that lay before you. You won't upset them. Let me pray with you. Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, I pray for that one watching right now. I feel the power of God moving right now. Father, put in them now a right spirit. Lord, we repent of disobedience. And I pray right now, Father, that you would send the fire of the Holy Spirit to so burn within their souls, within their hearts, within their spirits. Lord, put the word in their mouths. Put your power in their hands and put a fire in their soul. Lord, I pray that today would be a turning point, that today would be marked as the day that they decided to make up their mind, stand, and do something for God. Holy Spirit, touch them now with your spirit, I pray. Receive it now. God's doing, the power of God as I'm praying is flowing so beautifully. The anointing is here and he's touching you now. Receive it. Lord, let them feel your presence. Let the anointing flow and touch hearts, I pray. Never doubt again. You're called of God. You are called of God. You are called of God. Go and do something today. As usual, remember, you can sow into this ministry. Help us get the gospel. Remember, the world needs the gospel. You look around the world today and you say, Lord, someone has to do something. This is the something that you can do. Alone, we're all scattered. But as you partner with me, as thousands have partnered from all over the world with our ministry, join in with us. Join efforts and let's multiply together because we can do more together than we can alone. The world needs the gospel. Souls need Jesus. People need to know of God's love. That's why we do it. I believe that people need Jesus. I believe that the gospel has to be preached. And so today, I challenge you. Step out in faith. Go to the website. You believe that? Do you believe that the world needs the gospel? Do you believe I'm preaching the true gospel? Then partner with me today. Stand with me. Some of you can do something significant for this ministry. Help take things to the next level so that we can reach more people. You're blessed by this ministry. Thank you for tuning in. I also ask you to sow. So help support this ministry. Spirit Church members, you can sow online right now. Um, if you're watching this in the app, there are no options around you to sow. But if you're watching this in the app, you can go to spiritchurchonline.com to sow today. Help support the ministry. Be obedient. Don't wait. We need your help. I need your help, my brothers and sisters, to go and spread the gospel. Well, that's it for this edition of Spirit Church. Until next time, remember, nothing is impossible with God.